If you have your Bibles, we're going to jump right into it. And we're going to be reading in James. James 1, 2. And I'm just going to say, like, we're going to get right into some of the, the, the hard parts because I, I'm not a fan of this scripture. I'm just going to say it. Like, I, I love the Bible, but some of the scriptures hurt when you, you have to read them and, and apply them. Anybody can relate to that? Like, when you read a scripture, you're like, oh, man, I'd rather it say something different. That would make me feel better. Um, but James is, is, is writing right now. He's encouraging, and he's saying, hey, here's some things you need to do to better yourself. And so we pick this up in James 1, verse 2, and it says, Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters. See, right there, count it all joy. You know he's leading you into some, let's talk about it. Hey, we're going to count all joy for what I'm about to say. Remember, count it all joy. So James is setting it up. The first thing he says, count it all joy, brothers and sisters. Whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that testing your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work. See, that's where I got messed up. Let it finish the work so that you may be mature and complete and lacking nothing. That's tough. So he didn't say, hey, when you're in it, when you're in your test, pray for God to pull you out of it and get you out of it and rescue you. No, it's not what he's saying. He says, allow it to finish the work so that you'll grow from it, so you'll mature from it, so that you'll be able to benefit from the awesome blessings that come with that. And I titled today's message, Count It All Joy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today. God, we thank you for your word. God, we just pray for joy today. Lord, a lot of us come in with different parts of our lives and different things that we're carrying. And today, God, we're, we're, we're asking for joy to be what we walk out with. So, Father, we ask you to speak through me, God, because, Lord, I'm not talented enough to do this on my own. And I'm asking you to speak to us, God, through your word today. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Come on, how many of you have ever been told to choose joy? How many of you have ever been told that? How many of you wanted to punch the person that said that to you? <laughs> Let's be real, because the, the moment when someone's telling you to choose joy is because you're not being in a joyful attitude. Our first point is choose joy. And I'm, I'm one of four bro boys, okay? My mom is a saint. My mom, well, her mansion will uh, shadow, overshadow everybody else's mansion, I'm telling you. So I grew up with four, bro uh, three brothers. Um, a little bit about me, I am slightly competitive. Okay, extremely competitive. Extremely competitive. So when you grow up with brothers, so brothers plus competitiveness equals a lot of moments without joy. All right, we turned everything and still turn everything into competition. One of my brothers here today, Corey, from, from, in from Baton Rouge, and, and he can tell you, but don't ask him anything. Don't ask him stories. Don't ask him. Somebody's already, first service was like, hey, man, give me some scoop on him. No, chill out. Leave him alone. All right? So, but everything was a competition. All right? We extremed everything. Lawn darts. Okay? If you don't know what lawn darts are, lawn darts were an amazing toy for kids in the 80s where it was a metal spike, and you would throw it to a hula hoop on the ground, and played darts, but that was boring, all right? So everything we would do was competition, and we had to make it bigger, better, and so we're like, hey, let's do it over the top of the house. Yeah, yeah. when you're kids and you're like, let's just sling them over the top of the house. Don't worry if there's cars over there, mom and dad's car or whatever. So you go to play the game, competition. Everything else goes out the window. We sling these things over the roof, and we hear a sound. No, chill out. I didn't hit my mom's car. It was a kid riding a bike down the street. Um, I'm just kidding. But everything we did was competition. And there was a lot of moments of no joy. So when you, when you add, like I said earlier, when you add brothers, competition, joy, it's kind of like if you add brothers, competition, minus joy, equal mom, saying choose joy. A lot of mom telling me to choose joy. How I many of you got moms that told you a lot growing up? Choose joy. 
Change your face before you get out this house. Choose joy. Come on, some of you laugh because you're relating to it. There's a lot of moments where we have to choose joy, but to understand joy will help us to choose it. See, we think joy and happiness are the same thing, but they're not. They're two different things. Joy can eventually become happiness, but we look through the world and we look through life and we try to find things that make us happy thinking it's going to give us joy. I don't know if you've ever saved up money for something and then you finally get it, you use it, and all of a sudden the value's gone, so goes the happiness and joy. It's happiness. It makes you happy for a moment. When it's gone, it's gone. So one of, my, I, one of the things I, I said first service I thought was really good, I kind of came up with it myself. I don't know how true it is. But happiness is an outward experience changing an inward emotion. And joy is an inward emotion affecting an outward experience. Think about that. Happiness is an outward experience changing or affecting an inward emotion. There's a lot of things that you can do in life. There's a lot of things and possessions and different things will bring you happiness, but it's not creating joy in your life. It's bringing you happiness. It's impacting the way you feel on the inside. How many of you like being happy? God is not against us being happy. He wants us to be happy, but he wants us to live a joyful life. And joy is something on the inside that starts changing the things on the outside. And that's why the Bible's telling us to choose joy. He's saying, hey, you need to change your perspective and say, hey, I'm going to view my life, I'm going to view the things around me as joy. And it's a, it's a way of seeing, it's a, way, it's a point of view. Oftentimes we are waiting for happiness to fill our cup of joy and it never does. And we get frustrated and we're like, well, God, I'm doing all the right things and I'm looking for all the right things. But I just don't feel joyful about my day. I don't feel joy when I look outside and I see all the issues. I don't like turning on my TV and see everything that's coming against us and that's everything that's chaos and say, ah, joy to the world. It's hard to do. But God's telling us to choose joy. And James is saying, hey, brothers and sisters, count it all joy. No matter what comes your way, no matter what happens to you, count it all joy. Choose it. Choose joy as your point of view. One of the things I, I heard a pastor say, and it, it kind of stuck with me for a long time, he says that joy comes from the posture of grace and gratitude. All right, so how do we, how do we get a point of view where we can see the world around us, we see our circumstances and choose joy in those moments, it's, it starts by having grace and gratitude. So if we run everything through that filter of grace and gratitude, all of a sudden things start shifting. And I love what Paul starts talking about in Philippians, and he's in prison, he's in jail for being a Christian, and he's writing to the church of Philippi that's having some issues, that's concerned for him, that's panicking, that's kind of freaking out a little bit, and he's writing to them to chill out a little bit. And so we're going to pick that up, and, our, our, and Paul is writing, and what he's trying to teach the church of Philippi is how to have a culture of joy or how to um, cult cultivate a joyful lifestyle, which is point number two. Cultivating a joyful lifestyle. We're going to pick up in Philippians 4, 4, and some of y'all know this, some of you've read it, but I want to, I want to kind of sit on this, and I want to, because it, it does, it hits a little bit hard. It's, it's irritating, just like James. I don't like being told to choose joy and to be joyful and don't tell me what to do. But Paul's doing that. Paul's teaching. He's like, hey, I'm going to give you a secret on how to, to live with a joyful attitude, how to cultivate a joyful lifestyle. Verse 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say again, rejoice. Come on, how many of y'all remember that song back in the day? Let gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Gosh, that's hard to do. 
you don't understand like why my, I have my anxieties. You don't understand that I've got a lot of things to be anxious about. You don't understand why I'm struggling with anxiety. Well, Paul's saying, don't do it. And I want to get that today. I want to land that. Like, how do we, how do we walk that out? What does that look like? So Paul's telling us. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to the Lord. That's exactly what I was talking about. Joy comes from a posture of grace and gratitude. Paul's saying it right there. And then in verse 8, he says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. So now he's saying, hey, in all of the anxieties, yes, you got anxieties, and yes, you're going to struggle with things, but here's some things you need to find and focus on and think about. Now, I'm not saying you go through life and you forget anxieties there, forget your problems are there, because if you do that, you're going to find yourself in a whole bunch more trouble. Yes, there's moments to deal with those things, but he's saying, don't let that be the thing that runs your life. Petition it to the Lord. And then he goes down in verse 9, and he says, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen me, put it into practice, and God's peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you at least renew your concern for me indeed. So he, he's, he's receiving word back to them like, we're super concerned. He's like, hey, I appreciate you being concerned for me. But I'm more concerned for you because of the way you're responding. You were concerned for me, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm saying this because I'm in, not because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content Whatever the circumstances, I know what it has been to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret. How many of y'all are ready to write this down? I've learned the secret. You're underlined in your Bible, circle it, point arrows to it, write it down, get a tattoo. I've learned the secret. Paul's going to tell us the secret. Are you ready? He says, in every situation, whether I fell hungry or whether I was living in plenty I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We read that scripture all the time. I mean, Tim Tebow had it on his eyes, and that's a scripture we're very familiar with, and we're like, man, I can do all things through Christ strengthens me. Let's go get them. But Paul is talking about how to get joy. So if we just read that scripture and we use it as like this motivational, go get them. You can do it. Paul's saying, no, in order to receive joy and to walk in the lifestyle of joy, you are going to have to know that no matter what is going on in my life, that God has control. That my strength is not in me figuring it all out, but it's in God and control. When we learn to lean on that, we learn to say, God, I trust that you have control. That's what he's saying when you're living in grace and gratitude. It's because I don't need to have it under control. I don't need to understand it. I just need to say, God, I'm surrendered to you. And it changes our perspective. It begins to change the way we see things and the way we do things and the decisions that we make. And uh, about three or four, Three or four weeks ago, we had a men's night, and we were talking about pride. And I was talking to him, and I was telling him about an illustration about a, a bottle of Coke. Yeah, Coke people. And so if this was our life, it's contained, everything's in control, it looks okay. So this is our life, the dark stuff inside, the Coke is anxiety, stress, all the stuff that we have going on. Waiting to explode. But the problem is, we have this little cap. This is pride. Pride is our cap that contains everything in because it's our control. We get to control this part. And we say, yeah, you know what? Life can happen. Get a little shooken up. Has a little bit of chaos. You can see a little bit of chaos in there. 
You know, some people's like, man, it got a little bit crazy in there. Every one of us got on the, on the verge of a little bit of crazy coming out. But what happens is life starts happening. And our pride says, I'm not dealing with it. Our pride says, I'm not letting anybody in because there's going to be a whole lot of stuff coming out. And what happens is when we go through life with a bunch of issues and a bunch of things that we are hiding down and saying, God, I'm so anxious, we get problems and then all of a sudden life comes out. I don't want to get it on the TV. Y'all, I'm going to go over here. <laughs> life comes and wants to cause chaos. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do it. He's about to run. Dude, he was, about to, he was tightening up the shoes, about to run. I'm not going to do that to you. He's like, man, I'm never sitting on the front row again. But life comes and it wants to cause chaos. And you know what happens? Come on, everybody's got a friend. Don't say names, don't point to them. But you got a friend in your life that, man, somebody didn't deal with the pride cap. And all of a sudden, there's a mess that everybody's cleaning up. But I want you to understand how joy works. See, Joyce is the regulator that controls this. And it kind of worked in first service, so hopefully it works in this one. So joy slowly opens and says, hey, we're going to deal with it a little bit. I'm getting nervous. Y'all are nervous? All right. Whew. More? More life in it? So joy starts to regulate, hey, I know you got stuff. I know you got some pressure in your life. But we're going to regulate on how fast we allow that to come out. We're going to do it in a healthy way. And all of a sudden, he's like, oh, a little bit more. Ooh, that was a lot. Saw them bones coming up. And joy starts saying, hey, we're dealing with it. We're dealing with it. It's okay. We don't have to have control. You don't have to have control, but we got to get this pride out of your life. We have to remove pride from you. And joy slowly begins to help you see the perspective of everything else around you. It's not about my issues. It's not about that. And all of a sudden, we can remove. That was close. We can remove the pride cap and saying, God, you can have everything inside me because I trust you and I choose joy. I choose to function without this on my life. I choose to live a life without this keeping the mess inside. I'm saying you have full, full, <laughs> full permission to deal with whatever you want to deal with. Because I'm choosing to live a life of joy. And I want my lifestyle to be abundance of joy. That's what Paul's saying. He's like, hey, in order us, for us to live a life of joy, we're going to have to say, God, I trust you more than myself. I trust you with my, my problems. I trust you with my issues. I'm giving you my pride. And I'm saying, God, I'm choosing joy. And so Paul's saying, it is valuable. It is important for you to develop a lifestyle of joy. Number three is proximity will change your perspective. Proximity will change your perspective. So I'm going to get some help uh, from my daughter, Taylor. Taylor, you want to come help me? Y'all give it up for Taylor. All right. Can you just stand kind of on the middle of the stage for me? All right. Taylor does not, she's not used to these situations. So right now, Taylor's in an element or a, a position she's not familiar being in. Some of the things, if you watch her face and you watch her demeanor, the things that she's starting to think through, not wanting to make eye contact with you because she's like, hey, what are they thinking about me? What's, what, are, what are some of the things that they're doing? What are, what are, I can't control what they're thinking. I can't control what they're doing. And so there's this anxiety that's starting to take over. There's this, I don't understand what all these people are looking at. And I'm in a position I'm not familiar being in. But what changes is her proximity to me changes her, her, her outward look on joy. Do you notice the difference in her demeanor when the proximity gap, when you're, you're away from God and, and you start closing the gap to the Father, all of a sudden, joy is easier to see. Oh, yeah. Stay with me, okay? You can follow me? So 
her demeanor changes when she's close to the father. Yeah. <laughs> it's easier to be, have a little bit more fun, a little bit more relaxed. It's easy to see joy because she's closer to her father. So when there's a gap, it's a little bit harder because she can't control the things around her. But as long as she's with me and I'm in between you and her, there's nothing you can do that's going to impact her. Because her father is close to her. The proximity to the father is, is a buffer and saying, hey, I'm not going to let the things come and steal your joy. But this is what we do sometimes. We stay right here. This is what we do sometimes. We tell God, stay here. Stay on Sundays. All right? Don't bring that mess home, Lord. Keep it on Sundays. Maybe on a Wednesday. But stay over here. And we want the same benefits of being close to God with him being stuck over here. We want the same rewards. We want the same, same emotions. We want the same feelings of being this with God, but as long as he stays over here. God, I don't understand why I can't see joy. I, can't, I don't know why I don't. Proximity is everything. It changes your perspective on what you're seeing. You want a better viewpoint. You want to be able to view the world through joy. You're going to have to change your proximity to God. Thank you, baby. A lot of us are facing so many things right now. I'm not going to get up here and say, hey, guys, it's all going to be great. Just go out there and get it. No, we do. We have struggles. We have pressure. We have anxieties. We have stress. We have things that aren't going our plan. We have hurt. We have brokenness. And the problem is, is that we, we want to keep God at a certain distance because we know the closer he gets, the more he's going to want to deal with those things. The closer he is to us is the more he's going to make me bring up emotions I don't want to deal with. But yet I want joy so bad. I want to be able to look at the world around me and say, I see joy. I want to be able to say, man, I see the cup is half full. I want to be able to go out in the world and say, you know what? It's not that bad. God's still in control. But yet we look at the TV and we look at the, the stuff going around and we're like, man, it's, this is it. This is the end times. God's coming back soon. If not, we're in trouble. It's hard to see joy. and It's hard to see through the perspective of joy. Because everything is chaos around us. And when we take everybody else's chaos and put it on top of our chaos, we're going to explode. We're going to break down. If you want to deal with those things, you're going to have to change your proximity to your father. You're going to have to allow him to come in and say, you know what? I have it under control. I wasn't caught off guard that you're broken. I'm not caught off guard that you're hurting. I'm not caught off guard that you have an addiction. I'm not caught off guard that you are being tortured by people around you. I'm not caught off guard by any of your situation. He's saying, just come close to me. Close the gap. Let's adjust the proximity. I'm telling you, once I get close to you, I can completely change your point of view. I can completely change by you choosing joy. It'll be easier the closer you get to me. He's saying, just come. Stop keeping me from a distance. When I watched Talon, and I saw my daughter standing there and, and being uncomfortable, and she did it because she was obedient, and she was doing it because she knew her dad asked her to do it. But you could see her wheels turning. I'm uncomfortable. This is not easy. What are they thinking? What are they saying? I don't know what to do in this moment. What do I do with my hands? I don't know what to do. And a lot of us don't know what to do in the situations that we're in. But we pretend we do. And we try to fix it ourselves. And God said, I want to rescue you. But I need you to get closer. I need you to close the gap. I need you to come and adjust the proximity and say, God, I just want to be close to you because I know the closer I am to you, the more I see joy, the more I can see the moments around me aren't as bad as they seem because you're in control of it all. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, 
What is it that you're carrying today? How big is the gap between you and your Savior? How big is that gap between you and your Father? What are you carrying that God's saying, hey, I know you're crying out for joy. And I'm not talking about a temporary fix of happiness that is a quick little flash in a pan and it gives you a temporary, momentary relief of stress. But you say, God, I need to change my lifestyle. I'm choosing joy today. I'm choosing to walk out of this room with joy. I'm choosing to allow joy to change my point of view. And I'm going to cultivate a lifestyle of joy. Hey, thank you for watching Anchor Church YouTube. I want you to subscribe so that we can let you know when we go live and also when we post new content. Make sure also to leave a comment. Let us know what ministered to you today. Also, let us know where you're watching from and how we can pray for you. And finally, if you'd like to support Anchor right now, you can click the link below and your partnership will help impact so many others. I'll see you next time, my friend. God bless you and best ahead.